I have been studying final words for six years now. And many of you may have heard, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. Those are the final words of Stephen Jobs of Apple Computer. How many of you heard of those before? Oh, not, not that many. So how about Thomas Edison's, it's beautiful over there. Yeah. It's beautiful over there. So I became intrigued with final words because of my father. My father, first of all, um, PhD, psychologist, a bit of a skeptic, didn't believe in anything beyond this world. You know, a realist, New York, kind of gritty guy. And uh, he started dying pretty suddenly over a three-week three period. My background's in linguistics, so I have an ear for language and a love for language. So when my father started dying, I noticed there were interesting things going on with his words. So I started writing everything down over that period. And for those of you who may at this time know someone who's transitioning or in dying, I would encourage you and invite you to do the same thing, to track and write down those final words, because they might surprise you and inform you and inspire you and even console you. At this point through the Final Words Project, we've collected 2,000 utterances and final words. And we began to put those, uh, we, well, we have, we began to organize them by certain kinds of patterns. And the results for me, some of them are linguistic insights. Many of them, which I did not expect, are actual spiritual insights or things that surprised me personally and have actually given me a lot of comfort about the dying process and, and, and many other things. So let me um, get a little bit more specific. But before I do, you may notice I don't have my shoes on <laughs> tonight. And the reason I don't is, uh, for some reason, when I walked in the room tonight, I felt, you know, this is really sacred ground we're talking about here. And I just felt I wanted to take off the, my shoes in honor and recognition that we're standing on very sacred ground when we talk about end of life. And I know when my father was dying, excuse me, when my father was dying, we always took off our shoes when we walked into the room, sort of in honor and recognition that something sacred was going on. And as we look at final words, if we can put on a lens, have our imagine that what we're seeing is sacred, because it's not always easy, right? It's often painful. Sometimes it's not pretty. But to remember that we're walking into sacred territory. So before we even begin, I wanted to kind of give you our roadmap as we walk on sacred ground. Enter the world of your beloved. And for me, language is the key, is the tool for entering into another person's world. We enter into another person's world in many ways, right? But one way that we do it in life is through communicating. Anybody uh, ever have a grandchild or a child run up to you, maybe two years old, and say, me want a cookie, something like that? Well, you don't say to the child, excuse me, <laughs> your grammar's wrong there. We need to talk about, no, no. What do you say? Here's a cookie, right? What kind of cookie? Cookie, cookie, <laughs> right? It, we enter into that child's world. And in the same way, the invitation that I'm going to extend to all of you is to do the same thing with someone who you may love as they're dying, to enter into that world, even if the language you hear is baffling, maybe even sometimes scary. So. Enter the world of your beloved. As a linguist, I was trained that if I were in another country, I wouldn't think, oh my god, this language is terrible. Right? Or I wouldn't think, oh, they don't make any sense. I'm not going to spend time with this. I would sit down. I'm entering a new country. Keep an open heart and mind. Record in a final words journal what you hear, see, and feel. It will be your private travelogue about that other place. Have eyes for the sacred. 
If possible, imagine that the territory you have entered is sacred ground, despite the terrible loss or the loss that might be looming before you. Validate your loved one's words and experiences. Repeat back what your beloved has said and let the person know you've heard them. One pretty common thing we've heard or in the data that we've got is someone saying something like, I need my passport. You can say, oh, come on, really? You're in bed right now, you know what? No. Where are you going? Where are you headed? Yeah. <laughs> my dad said to me, my modality is broken. Technically, as a linguist, I could tell you that that's nonsense. But doesn't it make sense somehow? So when you can, encourage, engage in that world. Engage. Be a student of the language. Again, uh, you're in a new country. When you can, write it down. Ask questions with authenticity and curiosity. Tell me more. And assume your loved one can hear you even when they're unresponsive or quiet. Let the dying person know how deep your love goes and savor silence. One of my favorite stories of, you know, of the um, stories that we've gathered was from one woman and she felt such a loss, understandably, because she and her mother used to have the most amazing conversations together. And, that we, and just, you know, blah, 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 you know great con, con, um, communication and rapport. And in those final days, the mother became much less responsive. So this woman decided this one day she was going to walk into the room and imagine she could communicate with her mother. She went deep into silence. She opened her heart. And she just said, Mom, I'm with you. It was totally silent, but she sat there in prayer and, or meditation or just silence and savored it. So then a nurse came in and said, everything OK? You need lunch? And then the mother, who was still, I mean, relatively lucid. I mean, she was unresponsive at the time. But she opened her eyes and she said, I've been having the most wonderful conversation with my daughter. <laughs> it's a mystery, but it seems to hold a lot of truth. So those, those were some of the guidelines I gave in terms of entering this territory. And I want to also say, any of my, this PowerPoint tonight, please um, feel free. At the end, there's my email. Just email me. I'll be glad to send it to you. And if you want it as a reference for yourself. I didn't want to print out paper and do that. That's my dad. <laughs> you see a resemblance. <laughs> um, this is Morton Felix. This is, this was both. He's still living, obviously, in, in my heart and my memory. My dad was a New Yorker. New York, uh, he was not a religious person. He was Jewish, as I'm Jewish. And he used to say, I don't believe in all that God stuff. I'm a gastronomical Jew. Right? For him, that was like, give me a corned beef sandwich, cream soda, some coleslaw, and I'm in heaven. That's my idea of prayer. And I say that because when my father started talking about angels 10 days before he died, my head spun. Because this was not a man who would ever think of angels. You know, he was like, Oh, yeah, there's an afterlife. It's six feet under with the worms, right? That was sort of my dad. So um, that's my dad, my mom, when they got married. And mom, you want to say hi? Want to raise? That's my mom there. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> and that's um, them for their 50th wedding anniversary. Still very much in love. An important part of their life together is my mother's an artist, and my father was so proud of her work, and he would carry boxes to the art exhibitions for her. So what happened is three weeks before 
uh, as his dying process began, he walked out the front door of our house in, I guess, his underwear, sweatpants, on a January night, cold night, walked down the stairs. This was not typical behavior for my father. And walked down University Avenue. And when the police came up to this disoriented 77-year-old, he said, I'm bringing these boxes to the art exhibition for my wife's art show. Uh, sorry, sir, you know. I don't know what you're talking about. And they you know, took him and brought him to the hospital. But what my father said that seems so bizarre and so unique, I came to discover, is common in the language of the dying. Oftentimes, people begin to announce some big event is coming. And it's an event closely associated with their lives, right? So a golfer may announce the big golf tournament, or a dancer may announce the big dance. And we'll talk more about that in detail. So what I'm going to do is just talk about some of my father's final words to give you a taste, no pun intended, of my dad's, my dad's words. And then we'll move into the categories we began to find through the Final Words Project. There's so much so in sorrow. Again, that's technically nonsense, right? Now I want to point out that the words I'm going to share with you, these are, it's not that my father was some, you know, bed, you know, he wasn't, he was a genius. He wasn't a dying, you know, I mean, there's, this language is typical to so many people as they're passing. If you keep your ears open, it's amazing, the jewels. And oftentimes it's hard because we're so wrapped up in the health piece of it, you know, what's going on with their health and this. But if you have the opportunity, and I know we don't always, to open your ears to the language, it will oftentimes deeply move you and, and I think touch you. There is so much so in sorrow. So and so, repetition is very common. When you're packing for Las Vegas, better bring the oxygen tent. It's nonsensical, right? However, there is a pattern. And when you, one of the things that's great about science or collecting data is you can start to see patterns. So while this seems totally ridiculous on one hand, the truth is that people start talking about some kind of big trip coming up. And guess what my father was? He was a gambler. So of course he was talking about Las Vegas, right? My mom might be talking about Tassajara for the big trip, right? So it depends on who the person is. I mentioned this one before. Jack was someone who passed on before him. I can't reach Jack. My modality is broken. Again, sheer nonsense as a, you know, but it makes a lot of sense somehow. Lisa, you were right about the angels. That was 10 days before he died, he was sleeping. And I used to, I'm, I'm, I was more kind of woo-woo and believed in angels and stuff. And my dad looked up at me and he pointed. He said, oh my, you were right about the angels. This also, we've come to find, is very common. Introductory offer. Store is closing. This is paradoxical language, right? It's contradictory. And one of the things that's interesting, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with Life After Life by Dr. Raymond Moody, near-death experiences? Well, people who have near-death experiences who die for a short period of time and then come back and speak of their experiences, one of the things that's most common is paradoxical language. So they'll say something like, wow, I never felt as alive as when I was dead. What? It felt like five minutes, but it felt like an eternity. What? There was no space, but I went through this big tunnel. What? There's paradoxical language. And when you look at the language of those who are dying, there's a lot of paradoxical language, like introductory and closing, right? Open, close which to me as a linguist is intriguing, because of course, we don't see that as much in our day-to-day -day life. There are so many people in here. I don't have time to talk to all these people. 
I'll come back to that in a minute. This is very interesting, Alice. He was talking to uh, his secretary and editor on the um, phone a few days before he died. This is very interesting, Alice. You know, I've never done this before. <laughs> and this sentence, or these two sentences, are what got me hooked to this research. Because I asked myself, what the heck is this, this? Why didn't he say, you know, dying is very interesting. You know, I've never died before. Why didn't he say that? What is that this? And this is called non-referential language. You don't know what the person is referring to. This non-referential language is very common at end of life. Roger Ebert, the critic, do any of you remember him? As he was on his deathbed, he turned to his, I mean, he didn't speak it because he couldn't speak, but he wrote down, it's all an illusion. This is all a hoax. Um, and if you know Ebert, that doesn't seem quite like his character, right? He was very sort of, again, earth, earthy and fact-driven, but um, non-referential, right? Three days before my dad died, he said, the angel said, enough. That's it. Enough. No one's to blame. Go now. Three days left. This is from a man who didn't believe in angels. Right? And guess what? Three days later, he passed on. So from looking at the final words, it's not uncommon that people seem to know. We recently had a death in our family, and our, it was my uncle, and he waited until the anniversary, the anniversary, the wedding anniversary of the woman who was the love of his life, so he could give her one kiss goodbye. People seem to know on some level, and, um, and if you keep your ears, in open, uh, ears open and heart open, oftentimes you can get some uh, clue as to when someone might be ready to pass. Not always, but sometimes. Hurry up. Get me down, please. One of the things we've heard from people who have had near-death experiences, the first part of the near-death experience, is people describe coming up out of their bodies. And they can actually hear what's going down. People repeat verbatim the conversations the doctors are having. Oh my god, we just lost her. Right? And they hear it all. One woman who um, described uh, hearing when she was in a coma and she was really you know, just going, they were saying, oh my God, she's going to be a vegetable. Oh, she's dying, and if not, she'll be a vegetable. And she was really insulted. <laughs> it's like, no, you know. But those words, people hear them. People hear them. And the most amazing research, and it was done by a very reputable researcher at University of Connecticut, Dr. Kenneth Ring, he studied people who were blind, okay? And the majority of them, over 85%, by since birth. And when they had this near-death experience and were out of their bodies, guess what happened? They could see. Some of them had never seen their own bodies before. And, they, and for the first time in their lives, they could look down. And there are stories um, where they could even describe the doctor's tie, like what was in it. What is going on here, right? <laughs> he, the, Dr. Ring calls it transcendental awareness. There was some kind of awareness that goes beyond, goes above us. You know, consciousness is, seems to be non-local, at least from this research. So one of the things in final words that's consistent with this description of leaving your body is people start, here they are, they're lying in bed, flat as could be, and they're saying, I'm moving up. You're not moving up. I'm moving up. Some people, you hear descriptions of, I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going back. Come on, you're lying in a bed. Mm, something's moving, right? So when you start getting data of you know, dozens of people describing moving up or moving down or moving to the side, it's compelling. To me, it, you know, it's been very, pretty remarkable. My dad's final words, she was, she was fortunate enough that my dad was still speaking till the very end so he could offer to her and say, thank you, I love you, not everyone is able to hear those words, 
but there are other, other ways, as I mentioned earlier, you could feel and be connected at end of life without the language. Singing is one way. <laughs> So as I saw this collection of words, now of course this was before I established the final words project, so I heard these words out of context, but I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. What is going on here? And one of the things I noticed that there was nonsensical language, right, these nonsense statements, and then when my dad started talking about the trip to Las Vegas, there was something in me that thought, oh, maybe that's a metaphor for dying, uh, the art exhibition. So I noticed that he was speaking in metaphors and nonsense. And then every once in a while, he'd say to me, Lisa, could you get me a glass of water? Literal language, concrete. And so you know, when people often, the most common things people will say is, oh, it's just the medications. You know, it's just making people all weird. Yeah and no. And the yeah and no is that you see the same patterns of language no matter what the meds are. You see what I'm saying? So in a way, even though we didn't control for medications, if you're seeing them across the board, the same kinds of things, and you think, hmm. The other thing, which we'll go into more detail in a second, is people, when they're in certain states before dying, seem to be able to move in and out of seeing angels and so forth, or speaking in metaphoric ways, and then they will come back to very literal language. And that ability to move back and forth could not happen just on medications. Do you see what I'm saying? There are indeed, the nurses told me, yes, there are definitely times that people are affected by meds. I'm not denying that. But that there are certain visionary states and things that happen where you see this ability to go back and forth, which is a very different kind of thing, and that's visionary. And we'll, we're going to get to that in a minute. So the thing that I became curious about is did the changes in my father's language sort of track some kind of change in consciousness? I couldn't help but ask that, especially when he started talking about angels. So one thing we know about language is there's this continuum. Literal language, it's a rock. Y'all with me, right? Rock. We get it. We all know what we're talking about, rock, right? Metaphorical language is a heart of stone. Do I really have a stone in my heart? No. But it's a metaphor, and it integrates what they say often is kind of left and right brain. Rem you know, it's image with language combined. Metaphor. And then you have nonsense. And there's been some research to show that these different parts of the brain, different parts of the brain are activated when people use different language. So literal engages regions of the brain associated with literal and analytical thinking. And you know, these terms, left brain, right brain, they're, they're imprecise, but just give us a general uh, mapping, so to speak. Metaphorical language, what we've seen, engages both left and right brain hemispheres. There's a make, making the pictures, the more uh, holistic kinds of functioning, along with more analytical. So it's, it's both hemispheres. And nonsensical, when people start speaking no nonsense, we have found that that part of the brain that's activated when they're making beautiful music is the part that's, that's activated during nonsense. So you know, one of the things I began to wonder is I wonder if, as we're dying, our brains move towards a more musical, mystical, right brain state and the language begins to reflect that through the nonsense. But this is all, I've had some neuroscientists say, yeah, hey, that's possible. <laughs> but this is all conjecture and imagination right now. So did the changes in my dad's speech reflect physical changes associated with transcendental states of consciousness? Could it be that as our brains are shifting and changing and dying, um, we're moving towards new states of consciousness? So. So 2014, I established the Final Words Project with Dr. Raymond Moody, who coined the term near-death experience. I went to a seminar he did right after my dad passed on. And the third day of the seminar, Raymond said, you know, I've been wanting to study final words, and I've been looking for a linguist who'd want to partner with me. I said, thanks, Dad. I'm on. I'm so, and since then, I've been working with Raymond Moody there. 
and moved to Georgia to do that. So do we die as we live? To some degree, yes, or at least in the language. The metaphors, symbols, and nonsense of final words are often rooted in the personal and lifetime narrative of the person dying, often. You know, there are exceptions, but often. So here's an example from one daughter. My dad had been a roofing contractor and carpenter during his life. At my father's bedside, when he was dying, he would awaken and look over at me and smile so big. And he told me they had all these kitchenettes over there. There were miles and miles of them, and he would be helping to build them. He certainly was having an amazing time during his passing away, judging from the smile and excited look in his face when he would wake up. Now, here's just another example. You would never want to take away the wonder that's going on for that man by saying, come on, you're in a hospital, Dad. No, no, no. There's something going on. And we could take off our shoes, step right into his reality with him. Some more examples. Uh, Jeffrey Holder, the choreographer. Leo Holder, his son, shares the final words of his father, arms to three, four, turn, two, three, four, swing, two, three, four, down, two, three, four. And then he took his last breath. Poets, my father, these weren't his final, final words, but some he said. He said, I see interim spaces of poems. That's like a koan. You know, what, you know, isn't that like a koan? Wow, an interim <laughs> space, that's pretty deep. <laughs> Jack Spicer, another poet. My vocabulary did this to me. <laughs> One thing we found in our, our research is that the foursomes come up. So there might be a threesome, and they're looking for a fourth. Uh, and this comes up, you know, there are these three guys, and oftentimes they're already passed away. Joe, Frank, and Bill's there, and they need a fourth. <laughs> or uh, in poker. They're telling me I need to come and sit down beside them and smoke and drink, and I just think I'd rather stay in my chair. <laughs> right like this. But they tell me now I have no choice. I've got to play in the big poker game. Guess I'm just going to have to join them. OK, maybe it's meds. Maybe it's meds affecting him. But what, you'll, what we often see is when you write this stuff down, there's what I call a sustained narrative. Here they might be saying, the guys are inviting me to the poker game. And then three days later, if you track everything, well, they've just put the chips down. I think I'm going to have to fold. <laughs> right? And you notice, because if you hear this stuff in isolation, it's just like, oh, come on, really? What are you talking about? Or whatever. But if you track it over time, there's this amazing narrative, not always, but sometimes or often, that it evolves. The big dance or dinner, now that'll be me. That'll be me on my deathbed. I'll be talking about the big dance. Get me my dancing shoes. You may take yours off beside me, but I'm putting mine on. <laughs> The big dance or dinner. Uh, all right, this woman shared. My mother asked me to bring her best dress and shoes to the hospital because she was attending a grand ball that night and would be so happy to see me there. She woke up in the middle of the night and started getting dressed in a long gown that was in the back of her closet. Now, some people, of course, won't be able, you know, be much more unresponsive. Everyone's different, but in this case. She was sitting at her dressing table putting on jewelry and makeup. Nana said, I'm getting ready for the big dance. Then she laid down and died. Okay, so. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Another thing that's not uncommon is people will start talking about changes in the weather. Again, a metaphor that some big change is coming. The tide is turning. The reservoirs are filling. The storm is coming. Do you think the rain is coming? 
And these are all opportunities for a conversation. Right. Yeah, it looks like the tide is turning. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing, what you're feeling. Maybe we can get you, you know, I don't know. If they want a boat, maybe they don't want a boat. So one of the other common things at the end of life is hearing about the big journey. Some kind of trip is taking place. And I do want to say before I continue, because I forgot to mention, um, Maggie, oh, I'm just blank, Patricia Kelly and Maggie, did I, do you know their name? Maggie Callahan and Patricia Kelly, fi Final Gifts. Anyone know that book? Yeah. I really want to make sure that I acknowledge them, because I came in and did more research on the language, and they also had similar findings on certain pieces of it. So I just want to say, acknowledge their work, because it was foundational for me. And one of the things they talked about is the importance of the journey metaphor. The euphemism of death as a journey is almost universal in languages around the world. So now we're beginning to get samples from people from different countries and even different, you know, different religions. So I just got something from Punjabi. And the father started talking about an airplane, the big airplane he's got to get cut on. So the suitcase is packed, I have to go. The car is packed, where are the keys? Jetta, I need to get to my Jetta. You hear that plane going over? Is that coming okay? That's the coming of day. The trolley is near. In the story of the Jetta, the wife was arguing with the husband. I need to get my Jetta. Honey, you can't drive now. And the nurse came in and said, you know what, sir? We're going to get that car all gassed up and ready for you. You know, and that, it, because she was comfortable existing in this other world. Another thing that's common, and this is even on WebMD, okay, it's even part of the understanding in the medical profession, is that uh, generally 72 hours, if not before and, or a little after, you start seeing takeaway figures. Mothers, brothers, uh, even angels, people um, show up, sometimes animals might show up to, to as, as some kind of um, ushering the person. And some of the transcripts we saw were so remarkable because um, the person who was dying would start being in conversation with someone, an unseen loved one. So one daughter was talking how the mother was going, Earl is here, Earl is here, and talking to Earl, and then going back to the daughter, yes, she, she was like going between the two worlds. So pretty, again, things I had never expected to, to discover. Um, the angel said enough, uh, and all the language of departure. Another thing that's common is people will often say, I want to go home, I want to go home. Sometimes people do, they want to go back to their familiar bed and they want to go home. But sometimes they're talking about another kind of home, right? another kind of destination. And whatever that destination might be, whatever home might mean to them, you may say, what is home to you? you know, what's home? And find out. But that's as you get closer to dying. I think it's, yeah. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. One of the markers of end-of-life language is repetition. I just got a sample in last week from someone. This one, someone was proud of being a skeptic, no religious, you know, she was, very, you know, she was a very rational academic. And uh, she said the last words were, I am, I am, I am the great I am. <laughs> Those were her last words. <laughs> yeah. Her husband sent that to me and said, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, this whole idea of pieces comes up a lot, things being in pieces or broken, which makes sense, right? Because it's probably, uh, anyway, it makes sense to me. It's all in one piece. It's all in one piece. It's all in one piece. What you see in different pieces, it's all in one piece. And it's not uncommon in end-of-life language to hear sort of unifying themes, people talking about bringing things together in one way or another. Oh, more, more, more worlds and worlds. So profound, so powerful. It's time to get up. 
get up, get up. Remember I was talking about that thing about rising. This woman uh, was saying to, I think it was her niece, it's time to get up, get up, get up. See how it's time, okay. So I wanna talk just a minute about nonsense because as a linguist, I, I know that we have this strange relationship to nonsense. On one hand, Dr. Seuss has sold, do you know how many books Dr. Seuss has sold? <laughs> They've got millions, right? Alice in Wonderland. In one way, we love nonsense. And in another way, it, it's scary to hear. And I think oftentimes we use the word nonsense pejoratively. When I use the word nonsense, I don't at all. And one of the things I really invite people to do is to, um, whatever language you may hear from someone at end of life, to not be afraid of the nonsense, to not be afraid. Okay. One nurse I interviewed uh, told me, in my country, Trinidad, the nonsense people speak before dying is called traveling. I thought that was fascinating. So I think, how much time? I'd, I want to respect Kate's time here. 10 more minutes, great. So as I mentioned before, um, the paradoxical nonsense, I'm going to uh, prepositional nonsense. Remember I was saying people talk about going up. I want to pull those down to earth somehow. I don't really know. No more earth finding. Help me down the rabbit hole. Hurry up, get me down, please, it's the end. I've got to get down to earth, help me. No, wait a minute, you're one stop from real hope, which means one stop from real hope. I'm living between places. Would like to make my place mark that other place. Remarkable. Like Wow, again, this very rich language. And I think we've only beginning to I think we've only begun this study because I think it's so rich. I had mentioned before non-referential language is very common in end of life. And I've also read it's common with Alzheimer's, but that's not, you know, I don't have as much knowledge about that. So here's just some examples again. This is very interesting. I've never done this before. It is very beautiful over there. One woman who was in a coma came out looked at her loved ones and said, too bad I cannot tell you, uh, tell you of all of this. I tell you all of this. It's all a hoax. It's not what you think. It's all an illusion. So I mentioned before how common it is to have deathbed visitors. There are so many people in here, as you may recall from earlier from my dad, I don't have time to talk to all these people. So one of the researchers I work with most closely is William Peters in Santa Barbara. Anybody know him? Shared Crossings. He's a therapist who does beautiful work with shared death experiences. More and people are, re are reporting this experience of maybe being hundreds of miles away, thousands even, from someone who's dying. Or they might have a dream or get a, a pain in their heart or have some kind of experience where they are, it makes no sense, but they're not with that person locally, but they have non-locally, there seems to be shared consciousness. And he, I think he has 500 people now, and his book is coming out in the next year and a half. But one of the things happened to me, and I didn't know at the time anything about shared death experiences. I was, I was a teacher. I, did, I hadn't done any work. But what happened with my dad, I think it was about 10 days before he passed, I woke up at 3.15 in the morning. And uh, you know those digital clocks, they're red, they're that red. So I looked, I woke up, and I said to my husband, and I was in Napa, my dad was in Berkeley at the time, and I said, God, I just feel like there's presence in the room. Do you know that feeling when you know someone's standing in the room with you? And I said, wow, this is bizarre. I just feel like the room is thick with people. And maybe my dad's dying or something. And my husband very sweetly said, that's lovely, honey. Let's go back to sleep, you know. Whatever. So 3.26, I went back to sleep. The next day, I came to visit my mom, and I said, you know, how's dad doing? 
And she said, oh, he's doing okay, but the strangest thing happened about 3.15 in the morning. Oh, well, what's that? Well, he started talking about all these people in the room with him, and he didn't have time to talk to all these people. And David Kessler has a, has a book called, um, well, part of it is Crowded Rooms. This whole thing, it's not that uncommon. It's not, uh, not super, super common, but it's not uncommon that people as they're dying start talking about their room being filled up with a lot of people. Don't you see him there? There he is. That came from a, a man talking to his children. Don't you see him? There's my father. There he is. My mom was speaking to my stepdad, who died a few years ago. She was telling me how much better she felt when she saw him. Here's mom. I have to go. Peter Fenwick wrote the book, The Art of Dying, and he does a tremendous amount of research and reporting of these kinds of takeaway figures, too, if you want to know more. There, many people now have done this, so I, it's out there. The research is out there. My father died on a Friday morning. He spent the entire Wednesday before that talking, sometimes out loud, sometimes muttering under his breath, to a whole variety of people he had known throughout his life. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Let me see. Another thing that's common is what I call hybrid sentences or nonsense. Someone will talk about something that's in the present moment and then about something that's unseen. Okay? Get me my checkbook. I have to pay at the gate. I need my pearls for the dance tonight. Help me down the rabbit hole. Please massage my feet, right? Real feet. <laughs> but the rabbit hole, is that real? Is it our imagination? Is it another dimension? That I can't tell you. Get my camera. Someone who didn't use iPhone up <laughs> Get my camera. I need to take a picture of this. They left the ladders, but the ladders are too short to go up there. Where are my glasses and computer? I have to get to work. Visions versus hallucinations, I mentioned this a little bit. Um, but if anyone's interested in this area, Christopher Kerr, Dr. Back East, did very extensive research on visitations and, and appearances of bedside figure, figures. And he's convinced that this is not about meds, that there are truly visionary experiences. And again, an MD. A lot of the nurses I spoke with, just matter of fact, we said, oh yeah, people are seeing, people are seeing their deceased. And the doctors now are speaking much more openly about this, and they're having experiences. Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll and Jeffrey Olson had a remarkable experience when Jeffrey Olson, who was driving, fell asleep at the wheel, tragically had an accident that killed his wife, or you know, his wife and his small child. And, um, but when he went to the hospital, uh, the doctor saw the apparition of his wife. And the wife was saying, don't give up, and Jeff, he's going to make it. So this doctor was very brave to come out and speak this way because unfortunately we still have kind of a division between these kinds of experience in medical science. There, there's no need to be a division, right? All right, let's see. I'll wrap this up. I'm going to. So we know that nonsense is an important part of the language of NDEs and end of life. And as I mentioned before, 85% of blind respondents claim to be able to see during their NDEs or OBEs. I know I could see, and I was supposed to be blind, and I know I could see everything. It was very clear when I was out. I could see details and everything. So one of the things that I propose is, is it nonsense or a nuisance? And what I invite all of you to think about when you're with someone you love who may be passing, just imagine that maybe it's a nuisance and not nonsense. And uh, keep your ears and hearts really open. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, and please feel free to, oh, yeah, contact me for free um, PowerPoint. And if you have any stories you'd like to share. Thank you. Sorry, Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, I am. Uh, Final Words Project. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. We'll hold the questions. In, we'll hold the questions until after the program. Our second speaker is Kate Munger. Kate is the founder of Threshold Choir. For over 40 years, she has devoted herself to creating collaborative models for spirited group singing, joyful community building, and deep fellowship through rounds and parts singing. Um, well, I'm going to ask um, Jane and Heather to start. I mean, uh, Chelsea to start passing. We're going to give you something. Uh, Kate has written hundreds of singable, swingin', and deep songs that remind us of our best inclinations and intentions and are sung to accompany our lives. In 2000, she founded the Threshold Choir, and today there are 220 Threshold Choirs all over the world for choral singers who are called to sing at the bedsides of people who are dying, in a coma, newborns, children in hospital, and with folks who are grieving or who are incarcerated. In honoring this innovative mission, the Threshold Choir has reimagined what true service can look like, healing the giver as it offers comfort, presence, and ease for the receiver. Now retired from the business of the Threshold Choir, Kate lives, works, and sings along the shores of Tamales Bay, monthly at San Quentin, and most recently in Chico to survivors of the campfire in paradise. Kate will be selling and signing her CDs tonight. It's called Walking, give me a title. Walking each other home for fifteen dollars, and you can get that after the program. Please welcome Kate Munger. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Janet. Thank you very much. Um, this is exciting. Um, yes, I did start the Threshold Choir uh, nineteen years ago after an experience of singing at a bedside of a friend of mine who was dying 10 years before that. By the end of the afternoon, singing uh, at his bedside, I was convinced that singing was the way, one of the best ways to communicate calm and peace at a bedside of someone who's dying. I think before I say anything more, I'd love to sing with you. That's uh, my best way of communicating. And even though you have um, a sheet of paper in your hand, I'm going to teach you a song that's not on it. <laughs> because I like to see your eyes. The lyrics for this song are from Alice Walker. And the lyrics are, Even as I hold you, I am letting go. I'll sing it and you can join in. Even as I hold you, I am letting go. That's all there is. Even as I hold you, I am letting go. Even as I hold you, Even as I hold you, I am letting go. There's a lot of Threshold Choir members on this side of the room, so I'm going to ask them to start. Even, even as I hold you, I am letting go. Even as I hold you, I am letting go. Even as I hold you, I am letting go one more. Even as I hold you, I am letting go. So that's very typical of a song that we would bring to a bedside. It's short, the lyrics are beautiful and repetitive and help someone 
um, do something they've never done before, uh, go somewhere they've never been before, um, experience something that comes at the end of just about every life, I guess. Um, so I think I was onto something because when I started the first of now 200 choirs, 220 choirs, um, it, it caught on big, as you can imagine, in the Bay Area. And by the end of five years, there were, um, I think, 200 singers just in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then it has spread widely, Canada, Mexico, Germany, the United Kingdom, all across the United States. In a way, I think this is a normal human activity. And in many cultures, singing someone as they're singing to someone as they're dying is very commonplace. And I think we are rediscovering it here in our um, technological society. But I think it's really important. And part of what we do at a bedside is empower families and caregivers to sing for their loved ones and to remember that this is precious, precious, holy time. And rather than scurry around and make tuna casseroles with potato chips sprinkled on top and clean the bathroom for the fourth time, maybe it's time to sit down with your loved one, read the poetry that they loved, um, tell the stories from your childhood, if it was a, an aging parent. Um, but maybe it's time to sit quietly and um, enjoy the unfolding of this precious, sacred time. Let's sing again. Look at you are not alone. <clears throat> I wrote this song in the 11th year of the Threshold Choir, and I wish that I had written it right away. Because in a way, it says all that we can know about being at a bedside. We try to know abs as little as possible about diagnosis, um, how long it's going to take for someone to die. We try to know very, very little so that we're really fresh, uh, with, uh, fresh and present with what we're offering. This song goes, You are not alone. I am here beside you. You are not alone. I am here now. Try it. You are not alone. I am here beside you. You are not alone. I am here now. And if you all sing it really quietly, the th choir will sing the harmony parts. Here we go. You are not
And then we let silence happen after we sing, which is one of the hardest things to do. Um, there is this human tendency to want to wanna be busy and want to fill, fill the space. But silence, shared silence, at this sacred time is um, it's a gift to everyone. I'm imagining that some of you might be thinking, I couldn't do that. I couldn't sing at a bedside. I would break down. I would cry. Um, it's probably, um, if you think of that, it's possible that that's the truth. Um, as choir members, we, we know that this is a place where we belong, where we are happy and equipped and skilled to bring uh, something very precious to bedsides that not everybody can. That doesn't mean that occasionally a tear doesn't trickle down our cheeks. We try to avoid heaving sobs, but in our country at this point, um, so many people are uh, so tuned into um, television and movies and you know the, the, the technological society that we're in that sometimes we have to encourage people to feel the emotions that they're actually feeling at, at a deathbed. Um, so we hope that um, that our presence, you know, even with a, a discreet tear, will be an inspiration to a family member to uh, come to some kind of uh, place of forgiveness at the approaching end of life of someone in their family. Um, a lot of our songs um, talk about forgiveness, and not enough of them yet. I'm, I still haven't written my favorite song. Um, about forgiveness yet, but there is one on your sheet, and it goes, All is forgiven, move on. All is forgiven, move on. There it is. All is forgiven, move on. All is forgiven, move on. So we go to bedsides in groups of two or three or sometimes four. We go whenever we're asked. We hope that people will ask us with plenty of time so that we can get to know the, uh, the person and the family that we're singing for. Um, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we sing for one, uh, somebody one time. Sometimes we sing for them for nine months. Um, our services are free. Uh, we get referrals from hospice, chaplains, hospitals, um, doctors. Um, this uh, I don't sing at bedsides all that much anymore since I'm retired and I live out on the coast. But this last week, I was um, in town in San Rafael doing errands, and I got a call to sing at a bedside while I was in a car wash. 
And I still had cell service, so I said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. And the contrast between being in the car wash and then going to the bedside of a very elderly woman whose daughter had just had a baby and the daughter was sitting at her mother's bedside giving her the most beautiful sacred attention and love. Um, I think having just had a baby, she was so grateful for what her mother had given her. And um, three of us sang for about a half an hour at this absolutely holy place. You know, you could drive down a street in the town of Novato and not know that somebody was dying in that house. Um, so the contrast between the, the car wash and the bedside was profound for me. And I found myself thinking, whoever thought this up, good on them. <laughs> I actually hope, m my goal for the Threshold Choir, even though I'm retired, <coughs> is that we all recognize that we could, that this is a human activity. This is what our tribe does for each other when we're struggling. And so I'm hoping that, um, they don't have to be threshold choirs after a while. We just all can do this for one another. And um, not even necessarily when there's a death, when we're struggling. I'm hoping that in my lifetime, the power of the human voice on, on human lives is understood and quant quantitatively understood. Because I th we wouldn't have these amazing voices if there wasn't a tremendous power in them to heal, to affect cells, to move fluid. Um, I, I, I just think it's, I hope I live long enough. Uh, let's see, let's sing again. Thank you for letting me use your music. Uh, one of the places I love to sing the most is at San Quentin. And um, I met a, an inmate there who is now out and who is very ill that I wrote a song for. And it's uh, Soften My Heart. And the song goes like this. Soften my heart. Soften my heart, soften my heart, soften my heart. Try it. Soften my heart, soften my heart, soften my heart. Soften my heart, keep going. Soften my heart. Soften my heart. Soften my heart. Soften my heart. Let's just sing it really softly. We're going to the choir for three verses, three times through. And then you'll hear a, a partner tune with a Spanish translation. We have about, out of our 430 songs, we have probably 25 that have been translated into Spanish. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Here we go.
go to the high priestess room as you open your mind. You open your heart. Suavizando mi corazón. Suavizando mi corazón. Suavizando mi corazón. Suavizando mi corazón. Do it one more time. So, <coughs> suavizando mi corazón. Suavizando mi So we cuddle right up close, if we can, to the, the head area of whoever we're singing for. We bring our own chairs, so there's no furniture moving. We just come in and sit down, and we, we try to replicate the distance between a mother's mouth and a baby's ear. And so we are singing so soft that our gauge for how soft we sing is a closed mouth hum. So let's sing Soften My Heart as a closed mouth hum. not very loud. And it's as loud as we need to be. We're sitting so close. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of, um, you know, we, we don't want to direct the person's thought process that we're singing for, but we want, we want to be there uh, to catch them and to support them wherever they are. And um, we have all kinds of lyrics of songs. Um, very few are, well, only one that I can think of is very directive. And I, I have probably only sung it at four bedsides. But when I have, it's been really vital. And the lyrics are, it's all right, you can go, your memories are safe with us. And I. The only way I would ever sing this song is if I, if I thought it was a good idea and I asked someone in authority <laughs> at that bedside, you know, a family member, uh, especially if the person um, was not visibly conscious. The first time this happened was at a bedside of a woman named Margie and she hadn't spoken in three days, and her family was all gathered around her, and she was apparently comatose. And I, we sang for her for a while, and then I asked one of her sons, would it be appropriate if we sang, it's all right, you can go, your memories are safe with us, and he said yes. And we did. And when we were done, Margie went, made no noise, but mouth the word wonderful. Um, I asked uh, Martha and Cindy if they would come up and give you the sound of a trio, um, what, what a bedside trio might sound like. <coughs> Thank you. 
So what you just saw there was um, the inevitable editing that various choirs do when there's a word that they'd like it like to have it be different. So the original is "May you be healed." The local San Francisco Threshold Choir likes to sing "May you be held," and um, since we're singing, it's fine to change the words. It, you, it, it, we don't change them on paper because uh, we have beautiful uh, um, agreements with the songwriters that will honor their music, but at a bedside, if the words need to change, they do. Um, San Francisco Threshold Choir was the third choir that I started. I started the first one in the East Bay, the second one in Marin County, my home county, and San Francisco and the Peninsula were the third and fourth. So the San Francisco Threshold Choir has um, been going since 2001. We have had a long and very treasured association with Laguna Honda Hospice, with, um, uh, what's that hospital in, um, oh, Laguna Honda Hospital, ho yeah, and also with Zen Hospice Project. Um, any other places you guys want to mention? Coming Home Hospice on Diamond Street. Um, Say it again. Where is that? Tanel Hospice, or is it a rehab center? Okay. So, um, if you if you were to want to have the Threshold Choir come, or if you know that someone would like it. We love the invitation to come from the person receiving the singing. It's best if it doesn't come from a child of someone who wishes their parent might have been someone who would have liked to have been sung to. <laughs> we, we try not to have our, our singing be a punishment. <laughs> Um, and you would go to the website, www.thresholdchoir.org, and go for the locations drop down, find the San Francisco Threshold Choir and call them or email them. And um, then someone would call you back and explore what the, situ what the specifics are of uh, the situation. We would ask the condition of the person we were coming to sing, their spiritual practice, if any. Um, we are not a religious organization. We feel strongly that most churches take care of their parishioners adequately. Um, but the people that don't go to church so much are um, left in the lurch. And the people that think spirituality happens in trees and in earth and on the planet. So we have a lot of songs that speak to um, that kind of spirituality. Yeah? Um, let me sing you quickly one um, that, that fits that bill. It goes, 
Anywhere I am can be holy forest. Anywhere I am can be sacred sea. Peace and quiet can be anywhere I am. Peace and quiet within me. We also try to be sensitive um, and educated about multicultural issues uh, when we're invited to sing uh, in another language uh, with a different kind of a approach. We have songs in Mandarin, um, Vietnamese, Cantonese, help me out, Spanish, Hebrew, and we're always looking for more uh, in, in different languages. Yes, and we have some, we have a, a song that is the phrase that starts every paragraph of the Quran. Um, I'm wondering if any, there are, I think, six choir members here, and I'm wondering if any of you have anything you'd like to say. Let me tell you one thing. Um, you'll see Karen stand up and um, Peggy stand up. On our website, on the front page, Peggy and Karen are featured singing to a man at Le um, Zen Hospice Project just before it closed, named Luca, who recognized that getting accurate video of what we do at bedsides is really difficult. Often, I mean, mostly impossible. Thank you. Um, and he offered, he said, would you like to, uh, to let, me, let them film you, and KQED was right there, and they did a beautiful job of a four-minute um, video of what it looks like at a bedside, and Karen and Peggy were there. So do any of you want to say anything? These are very nice people. If that's well, possible. The thing is, is that um, my partner has Alzheimer's. And he, he, you, you can hospice. We would take your word for it. The sense that you know. We would take your word for it. And we would then make sure that it was something that he would enjoy. Um, we can tell immediately if, if we're supposed to be at a, a certain bedside. Yeah. Yes, please. Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah. We're always looking for more, though. Uh, yes, there are a few YouTubes. But look at our website. That's the official video. Yeah? Let's sing one last song together. Look at Walking Each Other Home. These are the words of Ramdas. <clears throat> we are all just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other home. We are all 
while just walking each other home. You all sing with me. We'll sing really quiet so we can hear the choir. We are all just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other We are all just walking each other home. Before we sing it one last time, I have this very strong feeling that there are a number of you in this room who feel drawn to this work. And I'm just wondering if if uh, transportation and whatever was no object, how many of you feel like this is something you'd like to do? Volunteering. You know, I'm, I'm not surprised. I felt a um, positive, positive vibe. Thank you. Let's sing it one more last time, and we'll have a time for more questions afterwards. I sure would. Uh, would you guys stand up and come and stand with me? Yeah, I will. Yeah. We are all just walking each other home. We just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other home. And now I'm going to ask them to sing at the bedside. Just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other home. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.